surgical management of the maxillary frenum. The maxillary frenum presents functional and aesthetic problems, whereas the mandibular frenum only presents with functional problems. There are three classes of frena, and the first class is broad and fleshy. Second, the papilla between the central incisors is normal gingiva, as we see here. And because the patient, this is unesthetic to the patient, notice how this patient purses her lips to hide that fleshy frenum, and you will note the normal gingiva in the interdental area. This is a classic example of a class one frenum. A class two frontum, uh, on the other hand, is also broad and fleshy, but the papilla between the central incisors appears to be frenal tissue and not normal gingiva, as we note here. The class three frontum, the papilla between the central incisors is missing, as you see here. On the left is the fleshy frenum on the patient who postured her lips to cover that up. On the right, had that front of been removed, and this is another case, you can see the dark area by the arrow which shows the concavity that is present. Convex tissue reflects life differently than concave tissue. And convex tissue appears pink and normal, whereas concave tissue appears dark and red. How do you avoid the red tissue there? By doing the phrenectomy combined with a laterally positioned pedicle graft, functional aesthetic results, an article that I put, published some 30 years ago. And if I were doing this article again, I would change the title to the phrenectomy combined with a laterally positioned flap, functional and aesthetic considerations. Because there's an animated video on here discussing the difference between a flap and a graft, and literally what we're doing here is a flap and not a graft. First, let's ask the question, does the frenum contain muscle tissue or not? Here we see a class two frenum, and if we draw a line, probably apical to that, we would find some muscle tissue, and incisal to that, we probably would, would not. This is based on a study by uh, Henry and his co-workers many years ago. Now, what is the rationale for this? In the developing fetus, the basal bone forms and muscle fiber runs from the frenum to the nasal palatine across the crest of the ridge. However, when the alveolus forms and grows down from that, those muscle fibers are left behind. So if you take a uh, biopsy apical to this black line, you will find some muscle fibers if you make it the histology incisal to that, you will not find any muscle fibers. What we're going to do is do the lateral sliding flap, and this is a very important slide. Notice how the Bard Parker blade is in attached gingiva. Be certain that it is in there because I've made the mistake of making it too close to the frenum, and when you bring the laterally positioned flap across, you will end up with a red line there where you made the incision slightly in the frenal tissue. So be careful and don't make that mistake. You can go ahead and remove the apical part of the frenum with a uh, radio surgery. You can use a uh, uh, scissors as we're doing here, uh, or you can use the laser. That's your choice. And you will notice on the slide on the right that the papilla has been de-epithelialized, but the papilla height has not been reduced because we do not want to create a black triangle. There we see where the gingiplasty was done. The initial lateral incision is necessarily made apical to the sulcus depth, for you'll see in a moment the reason for that. So here you see us making the lateral incision, and the lateral incision is made apical to the sulcus depth, and then the flap is reflected there. But if the lateral incision is made into the sulcus depth, the marginal tissue incisal to that will slough, and you will end up with a gingival asymmetry that is most unesthetic. You can see that we're now attempting to position the laterally positioned flap toward the mesial, but you want to go well up into the lip, split thickness wise, releasing the flap uh, apically uh, by very sharp dissection. And then I like to go ahead and, with interrupted sutures, close the uh, 
the apical aspect and you can see we're beginning to position the, the flap measly. Now, let's talk about the suturing on this. You see where we're piercing on the right and you see where we're exiting in the papilla. Note where the flap is pierced and how the needle exit in the papilla. This will be an interrupted suture and positions the flap incisely on the mesial where you want it. The next uh, suture is on the distal and particularly I want you to note the angulation of that suture. First of all, we're going through the flap but notice how obliquely we make that so it exits in the fat of the papilla, if you would, where you've got a lot of tissue. Here is where I've made a mistake. If you suture vertically, as we're doing here, too often you will exit in the sulcus and the black line shows what the tissue is going to look like on initial healing and you'll have an unesthetic result. So always angle the, su the suture as I have pointed out to you. So this is the result that uh, we got on initial healing and you can see that we have no black triangle and you see the papilla appears to be gingival tissue rather than uh, frenal tissue. But so often in these procedures there's a gingival asymmetry and you may need to go in there and do a very slight gingiplasty again evening this up so it gives a much more aesthetic result. Treatment of the class 3 frenum. Here you will see the papilla is completely missing and from the bulk of the frenum, when that is removed that's going to leave a deep concavity which we've mentioned will be so unesthetic later. What we did here was take a free gingival graft from the crest of the ridge and inlay it in that concavity so that we will have convex tissue across the facial rather than concave. We will go ahead then and uh, suture that to place and also suture where we remove the frenum in the apical area. So here you see it immediately post-operatively. Now when this heals, obviously that free gingiva in the alveolar mucosa is going to present uh, an aesthetic discrepancy. And so if you want to, you can go in there and create the concavity that we've talked about before and that will appear red like alveolar mucosa. Now, preoperatively, this is what we started with and if you'll look on the left, this is before orthodontic treatment was completed and you will notice the size of the dark triangle. But when the roots are uprighted, the papilla is squeezed which will cause the papilla to move incisely slightly but by paralleling these roots, the contact point is going to move apically and you will get an acceptable result as you see on the right. Now let's talk about combined treatment and this is one of my favorite cases. We did a non-surgical bone graft which will be the topic of another video later placed on this presentation. Orthodontic treatment was done and finally the phrenectomy with a laterally positioned flap was done, finally aesthetic crown lengthening was done, which ended up being a failure and I'll explain to you why. This is pre-treatment. Uh, originally there was no diastema between the front teeth. You will note that the post, some of the posterior teeth are missing and the bone loss that we see on the left was present. And I don't think anybody would think we could salvage that particular tooth, but on the right, after doing a non-surgical bone graft, you can see the light wire placed as we're beginning to close that contact. Ultimately, this is what it looked like after the bone grafting is done. Now, is that regeneration or is that just bone fill? Certainly without histology, we would not know that. But anyway, in closing that, look at how we have created a class two frontal. And you will see how the incisions were made laterally on this. And now on the right, you can see where we're using a barred Parker plate, just a plasty, that lumpy looking uh, lobulated tissue that appears to be frenal tissue. And after closing the apical aspect, look at how measurely that flap was brought. And on the right, you see the suturing that was done. 
In this case, I think we were using five alt sutures, and you will notice this is truly a periodontal plastic surgical procedure. We see how the area healed up, and we have a little gingival discrepancy between the central incisors where we went in and used the radio surgery unit just to create an ideal situation. But unfortunately, we ended up with no sulcus depth and the sulcus reformed and we ended up with this aesthetic uh, asymmetry, which we should have flapped that area and removed a little bit of bone. Now, another class three frontum, and this is an interesting case because orthodontics had a marked impact on this. This patient went to a general dentist with a three millimeter diastema between the front teeth, and he indicated that he could correct this by placing oversized crowns. Well, the patient was most disappointed in the aesthetic result, so therefore, he sent the patient to a periodontist to do a phrenectomy. Well, all that did was deepen the area between the, in the gingiva between the central incisors and actually made it worse. So then he told the patient, I sent you to the wrong periodontist. You need to have a graft done. So here we see the healed graft in place. And if you look apical to that, you have a sense of how deep that concavity was. In any event, these crowns, I think you realize, never should have been placed. So the patient was referred to an orthodontist who had a background in restorative dentistry before he went into orthodontics. The first thing he did was take those off and put on temporaries that were the right width. The patient commented, well, this is where I started. So this is the day when he took the temporaries off. And then six weeks later, that three millimeter diastema had been closed down to one. And you can see the crown size is normal. So, so often in the case of these types of cases, the patient says, well, what about this? What about this? And it morphs into a, uh, a full orthodontic case. And you can see where the tissue was squeezed, how it was brought down. And the orthodontics in this case were the compliments of Dr. Rick Robley in Fedville, Arkansas. So this is where we started. This is where we ended up. And you will notice that the papilla does fill the embrasure space as the teeth were properly aligned. So orthodontics played a key part in correcting the uh, situation in this case. So this is where she started. This is where she ended up. And you know, it doesn't even look like the same patient, does it? The final case. Uh, this was an African-American ICU nurse who had been in orthodontic treatment for about three years. I think the diastema in the in the area here probably was five, six or millimeters. And this is in the middle of orthodontic treatment. Well, if you have a five or six millimeter diastema, as you bring those teeth together, the tissue is gonna bunch up markedly. And she was actually biting into the nasal palatine tissue and was very irritated. I was so anxious to get started on this case that I did not take a pre-op. So here you see when I got through and I had dissected out, look what PD had done. He had dissected out the entire papilla and the frenal tissue was coming across the crest of the ridge. I cannot tell you when I noted this, how sick I was in my stomach. But notice that the teeth are not parallel. Orthodontic treatment is not being completed. So this is where we were in February and this is where we were in July, I think, seven months later. Look at how the papilla had come down. I suggested to the patient to go in there and do a little enamelplasty, creating about a one millimeter space between these teeth and bringing them together, which would raise the contact and bring the uh, papilla down. But the patient did not realize how brief that treatment would be and elected not to have it. So let's talk about that. This is a slide from Dr. Vince, the late Dr. Vince Kokic. And patients need to be aware that when they have a crowding situation like that, as these teeth are separated, the papilla is gonna go apically and we're gonna end up with a dark triangle. But what Dr. Kokich did was going there and do a little enamel plasty. And within a matter of a few days, 
The teeth were brought together and enamel plastic was done on the incisal edge to create a wonderful impact on that. There are three classes of the maxillary frontum. The first class is where you have a broad and fleshy unesthetic frontum, but the interdental tissue appears to be normal gingiva. Class two, or the second type, means that you have a broad and fleshy unesthetic frontum, but the tissue between in the papilla area looks like frontal tissue. And the third is where the interdental papilla is missing. Another thing I hope that you have learned is that orthodontic treatment to squeeze the interdental papilla between the central incisors is often necessary to get rid of the black triangle. And as we showed on Dr. Kokich's case, interdental disking will raise the contact point and by squeezing the papilla, the black triangle will close because the tissue as you squeeze will come down. And how much will that tissue come down? For every millimeter you squeeze the diastema together, the papilla is going to come down one millimeter. Unfortunately, I never got around to publishing this, so hopefully this video will help you understand the treatment of the maxillary frontum.